are going to call, if you, all the graduates up forward, if you have graduated um, in the last past weeks, or if you are graduating this next week, whether it's an eighth grade graduation or a high school graduation, or if you graduated for college, I ask that you would come forward at this time. We have some cards for you. Um, It'd be great to have a prayer. I see one graduate right there, Christina. She's got her nephew with her. Any other graduates? Some of the eighth graders might be in the back, but if we don't have any other graduates, if you are graduating, come forward. If not, it looks like Christina's going to get all the cards. That's okay. (laughs) Well, hey, I'm going to have a prayer for you, Christina, and for the rest of our graduates. Dear God, um, thank you for this time of the year of graduation and for all the hard work that um, the eighth graders and high schoolers and, and college graduates have put in, Lord. We, we dedicate them to you and the rest of their lives, and we ask that you guide them. We love you, God. Amen. Thanks, Christina. At this time, we are going to have our children's story, so all kids, come on forward. Um, the coolest person I know is giving the children's story today, so kids, come on up. All right, boys and girls. All right. So today yeah, I'd like to tell you a story from when I was five, way long ago. How many of you are, are five? You're three? Anybody five? Okay. Well, when I was five years old, I woke up one morning with a lot of hope, and I was ready for the day. I was ready for the adventures. And do you guys eat breakfast in the morning? Yeah, it's the most important meal. And so I, of course, was getting up, and I was excited for breakfast. And I don't know about you guys, but I do not like it when my food is touching other foods. You know the plates, when they have the sections, you know, and they have little princesses and dinosaurs on them? Those are my favorite plates, because then my food doesn't touch. Well, I sat down at the kitchen table that morning, and I looked down at my cereal. My mom put the milk in there, and lo and behold, she had mixed two different types of cereals. <laughs> Apparently, it had ran out, and then she just put another one on top. It was disgusting. I was so flabberg- flabbergasted. I could, could not believe that she mixed two of my cereals, and I was so disappointed and so sad, so I went to my room crying, and I was so angry, and I packed my bags because I was going to run away. So I put my toys and my teddy bears and my backpack and clothes and my matching suitcase. And I went to the end of my driveway and I stood there and I waited for the bus to come pick me up. Because, you know, the bus that goes around town and brings people around, of course it was going to come right to my driveway and pick me up. And so I waited there and I waited crying, tears going down my face because my mom mixed my cereals. And she came out and she goes, Lilia, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I said... You mixed my cereals. And I was so sad. And she said, I'm so sorry, Lilia. Please forgive me. It won't happen again. And even though I was so sad and so mad, I went and I ran and I gave her a hug. And I said, please don't do that again. And she promised, promised that she'd never mix my cereals again. And she, she never did. So it's important to remember that sometimes people make mistakes or you make mistakes. And that's okay. <laughs> It's okay to make mistakes, and we got to remember, when mistakes happen, we have to forgive people, and most importantly, God forgives us when bad things happen and we make mistakes. Okay, you can go back to your seat. Um, First of all, I just want to thank you so much for being my church family. Um, We're new here. We've only been here a couple months, but I was able to count on you guys to pray last week two weeks ago when my nephew was rescued from the Columbia River. Um, So now you have that connection. (laughs) Um, He's doing really well. Um, He is in the mental unit uh, at St. John's. Um, But 
please continue to keep him in your prayers. He's doing really well, and God is good. God is God is back, <laughs> as he told the boats that went by every time they'd try and rescue him, and he'd say no. <laughs> um, he's got a, a huge faith, um, which is what I wanted to kind of go with, where I wanted to go with this. Um, he kept telling the boats that came by, no, God's got my back. God's got my back. And my thinking is, well, he sent you three boats, <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but at the same time, um, his, his faith was huge. And, and it just kind of reminded me as I thought about what Mitchell went through, that we can't put God in a box and he's going to be there. He's going to rescue us. He's going to answer our prayers. We don't know how or why. I mean, he's, we know why, because God is God and he's got a plan, but, um, but he's just, he's so big and he's so great and we can't sit by and, and wait for him to answer our prayers the way that we think he should answer our prayers or, <laughs> you know, show him feel, himself faithful the way we think. And I just don't want to miss the boat. And, and my prayer is that, that you guys don't either, that we just keep our eyes open. So let's pray together. I just ask if you would like to come forward. Um, and or kneel where you're at, um, stand, raise your hands, hit your knees, however the Holy Spirit's leading you to pray. I would just invite you to do that now. Let's pray together. Oh, Father God, you are such a good God. You're such a great God, a big God, and there are no words that we can express to to show you our love and appreciation and our praise, Father. But we are going to continue every day to, to do our best. And you know our hearts, God, and we love you. And we do praise you and honor you. And, and I personally just thank you so much for this church family, that, um, that they have kept my family in their prayers. And they've had my back, had our back. They've had Mitchell's back. And I thank you, God. And, and I know there are a lot of requests represented here today, and there are a lot of praises. We have so much to be thankful for, Father, and we just want to honor you in our praise this morning. And, and we ask, God, that you will just keep our eyes open to how you want to work in our lives. We just want to join you in what you're doing and, and uh, put aside our own uh, ideas and expectations and we just look forward to what you're going to do in every situation represented here father we just thank you in your precious and holy name jesus amen We're going to be in Exodus 18 this morning. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and grab one. Exodus 18. Exodus 18, and we're going to be looking at a story found in verses 13 through 27. Exodus 18, looking at a story found in verses 13 through 27. 27. And the story goes like this. It says, The next day Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood around Moses from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning until evening? We could get the clicker. That'd be great. Boom. Got it. And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people are coming to me, they come to me to inquire about God when they have a dispute. They come to me when I decide between, they come to me and I decide between one person and another, and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. 
You're not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their lost my place here. You shall bring their cases to God and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy, who hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, and you will be able to endure, and all of this people also will go with you to the place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law, and he did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all of Israel, and he made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And they judged the people at all times. Any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. So we're going to be looking at this passage uh, verse by verse, so we're going to be here for like four hours. Um, no, we're not going to look at it verse by verse, uh, but we're going to look at the overall story, and we're going to hit a lot of those, a lot of those verses. And as we do, I'd like to talk today uh, on the idea that we need each other, that, that we, the Journey Church, um, if we're going to keep doing these great things that God has, has been having us do, and if we're going to keep following where God is leading us, that we need each other. As we begin, I'd love to have a word of prayer, so if you'd join me. God, um, thank you for this day and for this moment and for these people here. Um, Thank you for all that you've done for us, Jesus, and that we can study your word. Um, As we study it, I ask that our hearts and minds would uh, be open to the message. We love you, God. Amen. Sorry, I think I'm getting a little feedback on my cheek here. The mic's a little close. Um, well, hey, for the first couple years in college, I worked as a custodian, and apparently they called me the urinal cake boss in some movie. This is a screenshot. I don't know why. Apparently, I was good at cleaning the urinals or something, um, but that's what I did. I spent my time as a custodian, and the first year, my freshman year, I worked in the, in the boys' dormitory. And I didn't really have a specific job, right? Everyone else had something specific to do except for me. Uh, For instance, one one person's job was to clean the bathrooms. Uh, That's what you call a bummer, okay? Uh, Another guy's job, his job was just to clean the showers. And another guy's job, who we all envied, was just to vacuum all the halls. It's like bathrooms or vacuuming. It's a hard one, you know? Uh, but, but everyone else had something to do, and I just did whatever my supervisor told me to do. Uh, for instance, he'd say, Evan, go and scrub the walls in the dorm. So I'd go and I'd scrub the walls. Uh, or he'd say, Evan, go clean out the vents in the shower. So I'd, I'd clean out the vents. And, and one time he told me, Evan, I want you to spend this week cleaning or uh, scrubbing the bathroom floor. So every day after classes for two hours a day, six days a week, I'd scrub the floors. Twelve hours. And the next week, he came, and he looked at the floors, and he said, scrub them again. So I was like, all right, sure. So I was the guy that did whatever needed to be done, whatever my supervisor told me. Uh, at the end of the year, uh, I got a call from my supervisor. He's like, Evan, I'm graduating this year. You like my fake phone here? Pretty good. He's like, I'm graduating here, and... Uh, we need someone to take my job as supervisor next year, and, and, and I'm recommending you. And I was like, what? I was like, sure, you know, I'll take it. I'll take the job. So that next school year, Evan, the young lad, who did whatever needed to be done, now was the supervisor. I felt pretty cool. Now, now some people think when you're the supervisor, you, you feel cool because of that title, the supervisor, Right? But that's, that's not why I felt 
cool. What made me feel cool was when the top boss, her name was Anne, that first day I walked in, she handed me a set of keys. Yes. Keys that unlocked every janitorial door in the boys' dorm. I felt pretty cool. Have you ever received your first set of keys before? Maybe to your, to your first car or your first apartment. Maybe to your first house. Or maybe like me, you got a position uh, in a job and you got, you got a set of keys. You know that feeling when someone hands you a set of keys. It makes you feel special. It's like they're saying, I trust you with these keys. It makes us feel empowered. It makes us feel good. Well, what I didn't realize at the time was because I had um, the keys that unlocked the, the, the room where the bathroom cleaning supplies was, and because I had a key that unlocked a door where the shower cleaning supplies was, and because I had a key that unlocked the, the room with all the vacuums, that meant for the first month, a little more than a month, I was going to be doing all of those jobs because apparently... No one else was hired that year except for the supervisor, so we had to take care of our own buildings. So, I was the man with all the keys, but I had all the work in my hands too. Moses was a man who had all of the keys. Look what our text says. It says that Moses sat to judge the people and that the people stood around Moses from morning until evening. From morning till evening, Moses was the man with the power. From morning until evening, uh, people, the Israelites, would come to Moses and they would ask questions and they'd bring disputes that they had between each other because they wanted to know uh, how it was that they were to live uh, in this relational covenant with Yahweh now. And so from sunrise till sunset, Moses was listening and, 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 and listening and listening and giving answers and doing doing all this work. And the text goes on and it says that Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, uh, saw all this. Okay, apparently Jethro's pulling out a lawn chair and just drinking lemonade, watching Moses do all this work, all right? And, and Jethro sees this and he says this. He says, what you are doing is not good. He says, Moses, what you're doing is not good. And he goes on and he says, you and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out. For the thing is too heavy for you. Powerful language here. Jethro is using some very strong visual language. Um, now I've had the word, if I go back here, I had the word, where highlighted here because I want us to take a take a look at that. This is a very visual word. And, and, and the Hebrew word for where is this word Nabal. Now I'm not too confident that's how you pronounce it, but that's what we're going with. Nabal. Can you guys say Nabal? Nabal. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And Nabal in, in the Hebrew scriptures it means to wither or to fall. Nabal, to wither or to fall, such as leaves, flowers, and grass. And, and in the scriptures, uh, Nabal is used as a metaphor when something falls to ruin or is, is dying. For instance, Isaiah writes, he says, For you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers. That's the word Nabal right there. And like a garden without water. He later writes in Isaiah 40 that the grass withers and the flower fades, Nabal, <coughs> When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower, Nabal. The word of our God will stand forever. So Jethro is using some very strong visual imagery. He's saying, Moses, if you keep holding on to all of the keys, if you're the only leader, if you're the only one doing all this work, not only you, but you and everyone following you, all of the Israelites, are going to wither and fade away.
question that I want to ask each of us here this morning is, is what keys do you hold? Do you, have, do you have a responsibility in this church? Are you a leader in this church? What keys do you hold? Maybe you're a, maybe you're a greeter, or um, maybe you're, you're a deacon, or on the sound team, or Sabbath school teacher, or maybe you're a volunteer. If, if you have a responsibility in this church, we're leaders, and we, we hold keys, metaphorically speaking. The first time I was asked this question, uh, myself and all the pastors and all the teachers in the Oregon Conference were asked this question, and I was like, dude, I don't know what keys I hold. You know, like, tell me. And I was like, I am so stupid. I literally have a physical key to the church that I work at. I was, I was like, what? And it hit me. It's like, I'm a pastor, and I, metaphorically speaking, I have keys that I can use to open up doors for people or to keep them shut. And, and, and I realized that as a leader, it's, it's important for us to recognize what keys we have. We need to recognize that. After working all by myself for that month as a supervisor, um, I tell you, um, after working for a month and a couple weeks, um, the, the boss, and she sent over three other guys to come and help me. And thankfully, yeah, my, my life got a lot better, um, easier. It got a lot easier. The weight was lifted. One guy cleaned the bathrooms, one guy did the showers, another guy vacuumed, and I got to supervise and do some other things in the dorm. Um, but that would not have happened if, if Anne did not take that time, that whole month, to interview many different people. Anne took the time to look through different applicants for able people to come and help me. And, 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 and good leadership is constantly looking for others that could help. Look what, look what our text says. I think I skipped a page. Sorry, guys. One second. It says this. It says, uh, Mo- this is Jethro speaking. First of all, he said, Moses, what you're doing is not good. If you keep doing this, you're going to wither and, y- and you're going to fade away. Now he says, now obey my voice. I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people uh, before God and bring their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look, what's that word there? Look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy, who hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. Jethro tells Moses to look for able men. Why is this important? Why is this important that as leaders, if we're leaders in the church, that we should be looking for other leaders? Why is this important? Well, well, Jethro has already said, if we don't do this, the negative thing is, we're going to wither, we're going to fade away. But he has some good news if we do do this. Jethro says, if you do, if you look for other leaders, this is what he says. He says, if you do this, God will direct you, and you will be able to endure, and all the people also will go to their place in peace. Moses delivers the Israelites out of, out of slavery, and where are they headed? They're headed to the promised land. And Jethro says, hey, it's going to go two ways here. You guys, you guys can look for other leaders and get there peacefully, or it's going to be a tiring journey there. Journey Church, if, if, we want to, if we want to do amazing things for the kingdom of God, if we want to keep doing amazing things, uh, we need to be looking for the gifts that God has given us. We need to be looking for other leaders, which isn't an easy thing to do. Look what Jethro says. He says that he asked Moses to look for men from all the people. And later it says that, that Moses 
followed the advice, and he chose able men out of all of Israel. There was probably, some people think, two, uh, two million Israelites at that time, roughly 700,000 men. So Moses isn't just spending 30 minutes looking for people. No, he's spending weeks and months looking for able men. Now, some of you may be thinking, man, I'm not even a leader in this church. This is my first time here today. And if you are, if this is your first time here, we're so glad to have you guys here. Um, welcome. Um, and if you're thinking, this sermon is not for me, I'm not a leader, I don't, I don't even, I haven't even helped out. Um, this sermon is for you, and it's for all of us. If you're a leader, first off, let's be looking for people to, to, that can do the work that we do. And if you're not a leader but you're wanting to be invested in the church, if you're wanting to volunteer, if you have a gift and you're wanting to help out, please make yourself known. Let yourself be seen. Um, I think, I'm not sure how many months, I think we're going on eight months that that Rick and I have been here. I mean, from those past eight months, I have fallen in love uh, with you people at this church and at this school. Um, and I fall in love with, with the kids at this school and at this church. And some of you are thinking, like, I did not know someone else could love my kids, you know? <laughs> you guys have amazing kids. Um, and yeah, a, l- a lot of days at PE, they push my buttons, but I gotta tell you, they are, they are some amazing, amazing kids. And I have a passion for kids um, and for youth, and I want to do all I can and put on the best events, and put on the best festivals, best Sabbath school classes. Getting a little emotional here. <laughs> here I don't know why. Um, but yeah. <clears throat> wow. <laughs> um, I want to do the best I can so that kids can meet Jesus. Um, yeah, I wasn't planning on crying. Sorry, guys. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, and here's the thing, I don't want to take off my glasses because it's going to mess up the mic. What's g- <laughs> I want to do as much as I can for the kids, um, but I can't do it alone. There went the mic. <clears throat> and we have leaders. Take a deep breath, Evan. We have leaders in this church. <clears throat> who are who have some awesome ministries going on and <clears throat> awesome visions and dreams that they want to do but we can't do it alone we need each other amen, amen. we need each other firstly if you're a leader what keys do you hold be aware of that and secondly let's be looking for other leaders who who we can say you have a gift that I think you would be great to, to learn something from me, that I could build a relationship with you. Be looking. If you're not a leader, make yourself known. Make yourself seen, okay? Um, and, and a little side note here, not really a side note. This is a good point, um, a main point. Uh, leaders are not only adults. Leaders are our young people and our kids. The research shows you guys that um, if you walk into church, churches, um, I think it's in America, um, you're going to see a lot more gray hairs than, than non-gray hairs. Um, there's more older people in our churches is what the research shows. And, and we're not growing young, most of the churches. But the churches that are growing young, the churches that have lots of kids in them, the research shows that one of the things, there's about five five things they point out, but one of the things is that the leaders are passing their keys off to the kids. They're passing their keys of leadership off to the kids. So let's remember, let's look to pass our keys to our, to our kids in our church, okay? Kids are important. Also, when we pass our keys off of leadership to our kids, that opens up doors um, into the church. And if we're keeping those shut, they're going to go through some other doors and might might choose not to come to the church. <clears throat> All right, I made it through. Here we go. The text goes on. 
the show must go on. The text goes on and it says, So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law. And he did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel, and he made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, fifties, and of tens. And now I want to focus on this word made here real quick. Um, we're, we're looking at a couple Hebrew words. Hope that's all right with you. I like words. I don't, it's weird. I like words. <clears throat> Anyways, now I'm not a professional translator, but I think this could have been translated better or differently. And that's because the Hebrew word for, that's used here for made uh, is the word natan. Uh, it's where we get our name Nathan. Any Nathans in the house? Awkward. Okay, none. <laughs> Any middle name? Nathan, come on. No. Nathan. In, in the ton, in, in the Hebrew, it's the verb that, that is translated to give. It shows up like uh, 1,800 times in the Old Testament. And if you look it up in the dictionary, the main definition of Natan is to give. So I can't imagine Moses going around, you know, looking through the men and saying, hey, you look like you can do the job. You're, I'm making you a leader. I'm not, I can't imagine him forcing people into leadership. No, Moses spent his time. First of all, he, he looked, he realized the leadership abilities he had. And then he went and he looked for able leaders. And then he, I would imagine he would invite them and he natan. He gave part of his leadership over to them. He didn't just make leaders, he gave his leadership to them. If you're a leader, I encourage you to, as you recognize what it is, what your leadership position is. After you look, I encourage you to take that step to invite someone into the opportunity of, of serving the ministry that you serve. And, and, and part of giving, what's on the opposite side of giving? Receiving. It might be scary if someone invites you to, to participate in their, in their ministry or in their passion. Um, and instead of, instead of saying no right away, maybe, maybe pray about it. Or maybe give it a, tr maybe give it a shot for a couple of weeks. If you, if they, if someone invites you and you receive that, you can try it out. And if you don't like it, you can just say, you know, it's not for me. But if you're, if you're a leader, I want, I want, I want us to be praying that we would, that we would find and see people who we could invite into our, into our ministry. And if you're not a leader, I encourage you to be praying that God would, would put something on your heart to, to find a ministry that you want to be involved with. First off, let's be aware of the keys we hold. Secondly, let's look for other leaders. And thirdly, let's give our keys away. Not just make and force leaders, but let's give our leadership away. Um, at the just going to conclude here real quick. Um, after those three guys came to, <laughs> to work with me, yeah, like I said, a lot of my work was taken from me, and my life was a lot less stressful and a lot less work. Um, but one of those guys, his name was Eric, and Eric was the guy who drew the short straw. He had to clean the bathrooms. Um, and, I, and I had my own keys, and I gave, I physically, I gave them all keys, but Eric got a set of his own keys, and he did an amazing job cleaning the bathrooms. He made mistakes, but he did a great job. And that next year, Eric actually became a supervisor himself in another building. Uh, and and what, what happened, he would receive his own supervisor keys, and then he would pass his keys out to other people. This is how biblical leadership um, um, runs. It's how biblical leadership works. The truth is, the story we looked at this morning is a great example of that, but it's all throughout Scripture. When God created humankind, he created Adam. The first, one of the first things he does is he gives him the job to name the animals, a job that God could have done himself. He tells Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I'm not going to do it by myself. I'm going to do it through you. 
when Jesus came, he had some followers, right? He had 12 disciples. In Luke 10, it says he sound, sends out 72 people to go and do ministry. Leadership through the scriptures is not about one person doing everything, but about leaders making other leaders and then making other leaders. God has done great things through humans in the past because that's how his leadership works, and he wants to do great things through each and every one of us here at the Journey Church. Amen? And to do that, we need each other. Thank you.